to chat to me and pers persevering with the tech problems. I appreciate it. Yeah, All right, that's okay. okay. Hey guys, um, you're recording now. I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, bye bye. So yeah. you're on a film set at the moment, is that right? So again, are you on a film set at the moment? No, I'm in my house. Okay. <laughs> I, I thought you said in I thought you said in one of our early emails I'm going to be on set or something. I must have got that wrong. Oh god! If I did, then I don't know what I was talking about. But no, I mean, <laughs> oh, uh, this is uh, the the room I normally do this in is, is the the top. The house has got three floors. Right. I, I use the top floor because it's the furthest away from the kids and and Gemma and the dogs and all the barking and the the leaf blowers and the gardens and all that shit out. Outside, but today the uh, the cleaning ladies are here, so I've been put in downstairs in Gemma's. My wife is called Gemma. I've been put into her den. So if you hear singing and dogs barking, awful singing and dogs barking, that that'll be why. You've been positioned, Gary. You've been placed. I have, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know, I know a little bit about the family, your family, purely because I really enjoyed um, Android in La La Land. I watched that. Um, oh, right. yeah, yeah. I thought that was great. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was good. And I've been uh, I've been listening to um, Intruder because I'm um, not only a fan of yours, but I'm a fan of Paul Mullen from your code name is Milo. Who I know you you work with on it. Yeah, I know Paul. Well, um, more in the video actually. Paul was um, in fact again last last week. I worked with Paul. Yeah, I like Paul. Paul was a very good man actually, and very very clever. He did a he he did a, a song um, when I was working on the last album. I was struggling a little bit to to find sort of the right direction for it, and I'd done a few things, and then I heard um, then I heard a a loser's song. Uh, can't remember the name now, unfortunately, but it was just it was so brilliant. I, I I stopped everything. I wrote I wrote to A. Fenton, who produces my stuff, and said everything we've done so far is is not good enough. So we need to go back and just start again. Because I said, listen to this. And it was one of Paul's songs, and it was a, yeah, it was it was a good thing actually because it it made us rethink the album. We we made a much better album because of it. Well, in the northeast, uh, his band, your code name is Milo, were really huge and had like a cult following, and they've been trying to get back together, do a reunion gig for a while. And I've got oh, my really? ticket, and it keeps getting pushed back. So then, when <laughs> I heard he collaborated with you, I was like, well, that's something. That's cool. That's going on. <laughs> he's over here now, isn't he? I mean, he's he's. Yeah. Um, He's out in the desert. I was with him. What's the date now? Last week or week before, I can't remember because we were shooting a new video for the next single, really? uh, and he's part of the, the the team putting that together. So, at one point, we were trying to dig out a jeep that got stuck in the in the sand, and then we got a storm hit, and we got stung. And we were walking, trying to trying to find our way back to our camp, which where where our safety was, because everything was flooding. It was the weirdest thing. Didn't expect. Uh, we were driving there. Funny enough, we were driving along into this vast expanse of desert with mountains in the distance, and coming down this hill into this flatland, and there was a sign on the side of the road saying "danger, flooding," and I thought, "Fuck off!" You know, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not flooded here in a thousand years, with the looks of it. And, and within two hours, it was flooding. It was amazing. I, this big storm came in. The water came down in absolute torrents, and it just didn't go in. It just start, stayed on the surface. And most of most things, you know, I had to eat my own sarcasm at that point. It's an interesting thing you say that because I recently read, you know, Revolution, and the number of adverse events that you overcome, you know, particularly with your flying, you seem to be kind of constantly averting disaster, Gary, all the time. It's like it's quite impressive the episodes that you sort of go through. Oh, I do like a challenge. Yeah, I do actually. Yeah. Makes, makes yeah, yeah, those things when those things come along, I think um, it sort of it makes life interesting, doesn't it? And it and it and it is challenging. And you, you know, you've my I spent the first darkness fell after the flooding, and I spent the, the first sort of 30 minutes walking around this sort of flooded desert landscape in the pitch black with my torch trying to find a, a way through the rocks to get us all out, wow. and um. Did it though we got I mean, we all got out eventually but there was this tortuous path because the road coming in was completely flooded you know that that was impassable so to try to find a way across the rocks back to the route 66 actually the main road that was nearest to our camp was was um, a fairly dilapidated stretch of route 66 it was 
Yeah, it just felt quite cool, actually. But it was good. I love all that, though. I mean, I love it. All the whole, all the flying stuff and the flying around the world and all the different things that have happened. You know, it's it just makes life interesting. That's I've only got one. You know, as far as I'm I'm concerned. So you want to you want to live it, don't you? You know, get as much out of it as possible. What I find really interesting is the thought of when you have these experiences, and, and even if they are testing or even traumatic, how as an artist it kind of makes an impression on your consciousness. And I find it interesting how it might turn up in a video, you know, that scenario you've just described, it, where it might turn up in your music. It's weird how um, it gets filtered through into your art, don't you think? It does at times. Not everything does, but a lot of it does. You know, Macar's, for example, was a a particular incident that happened so you know that that became a song it's not always experiences sometimes it's worries and concerns you know right. about you know what the future might hold and things like that um but sort of life in general yes in one way or another whether it's experiences or concerns yeah um you froze for a second there but i've got you now Okay. I, want, I want to go back to, if it's all right with you, Gary, when you um, first became publicly known with Replicas, because I know you've been a really big influence on so many musicians, but um, the front cover of Replicas was kind of what first got me published as an author, because I was really inspired by this image on the front cover of the first album. And yeah. I, want to, I want to go back to that, if I may. When you first became publicly known with Replicas, to what extent was your vision of the world being reflected in those songs? You know, were, were you conscious of that or is it just what came out? No, I was really conscious of it. Um, it the, the Replicas was actually, a, came from a, a series of short stories that I was writing, which were my idea of what London might become in the next 50 years or so. Wow. Um, and it was all to do with, you know, the onslaught of technology and how that was changing things. And uh, in, in a peculiar way, not dissimilar to what I'm doing now, but back then, the concern was all about technology. And it, and it seemed to me that if you was to hand over you know, the running of things to, to machinery, to technology, then it, would, it, would, it must surely realise fairly quickly that the, the, the problem to a smooth running society is people. So it would need to get rid of us. You know, we were the obstacle to to it achieving its mission of of having this incredibly organised world. And so it was all about um, how that would how that would sort of shape itself up. How how would that happen? What te what te what technology would evolve into? Um, how brutal that could be, and how frightening it would be. Uh, you know whether we would recognise it in time. So it was all just very much sort of a a childish sort of science fiction view of the future. So I'm not claiming any great insight in there. Really well, nuanced to me. It seems, you know, it's got characters and, you know, the theories with the, with the Mac man and all of that stuff. It seems quite nuanced. Like what I was going to ask you is, have you ever thought about getting it published and getting it out there with stories? I wonder if, I think people would really respond to it. Do you reckon? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, all, all, of my, all of my ideas for, for um, stories, uh, they, they all get, um, stolen and used in songs because I'm always making albums and I'm always wanting to write books but I never get to actually finish the books because I'm always doing another album but so uh, yeah the last one Sa Savage that that started out as as a book I was writing a book called Ruin about the future you know the future apocalypse and how brutal again <laughs> people would become you know in a, to, mm. to survive in that post climate apocalypse apocalyptic world um and I was doing quite well with that one, you know. It was beginning to flesh out nicely, and then, um, and then it came time to start on the album. So I just borrowed a couple of ideas from the book to get me going, and then Trump started to say the things that he said, and I got really concerned about the direction America was taking, as you know, in relation to climate change. And so I started to peel for more and more ideas from the book, and and eventually the album became a musical version of the book. So now I don't, you know, yeah, now I'm not sure there's any point in doing it. I think what's going to happen in, in a few years, um, uh, I, I mean, there's going to come a point when I'm going to not want to keep making albums and touring. I guess, you know, yeah. I, 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 th I believe that's true because. Um, I'm getting older, you know, I mean, I'm 63 now and there's going to come a point where wiggling around the stage is going to become a bit impractical and embarrassing. So that's got to stop. Um, 
And I do find making the albums really, really stressful, each one more than the one before. So I think for my own sort of sanity, at, at some point, I'm going to just want to stop that and just have, a, you know, let's have some years where there's no stress. But yeah. the thing that I can imagine taking over when I get to that point is finishing off all these books I've started or just writing. You know, I think that would, that would be a nice thing to... I'd love to move into that. I, just, I don't know if I'm any good at it, you know, so I've been a little bit arrogant, I suppose, in assuming that I could just jump into that and do it because, you know, there's a huge skill involved in that, which I I may not have, probably well, there's, don't. There's a few kind of jumping off points there, Gary. I mean, one for me is if you've got all of these, if you've got these stories, and I think the world of those stories sounds very rich with the characters and everything, then when they become part of lyrics, a part of songs, does it make the lyrics quite rich because it's having to be shoehorned, the, all this prose is having to be shoehorned into a lyric form. But like, there seems to be something about the prose to lyric translation that, that seems to have been really working for you. It is, it, it, it does work. You know, if you get it right, it, it works. Now you can shoe an awful, shoehorn an awful lot of um, information into some carefully selected lyrics because the lyrics not, don't just yeah. speak to you as words. They paint a picture of what you're trying to describe or a feeling that you're trying to give over. So, we, you know, with the lyric, you can afford to be far more um, restricted in the amount of wordage that you can use to explain something than you can with a you know, with a story or a, or a book. But you inevitably miss miss out detail in that, and perhaps you know, you think of a wider interest which you can explore more fully if you're if you're writing a story. Um, yeah. But it works, you know, it works for me. And of course, with music, you've got the music itself to back up that mood that you're trying to create because the music itself creates a mood that the lyrics then simply add the finishing touches to. So as a package, I think it probably works reasonably well. Mm. But it doesn't tell the full story in, in a way that a, a book could, you know, you or a fully developed story could. You must be quite a harsh editor of yourself then because it's not like... There's, there's millions and millions of words in your lyrics. It always seems mm. to stand so well. You know, it's amazing to me in how friend, um, our friends on Electric people don't know what that subject matter actually <laughs> is in there. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was good. I couldn't I couldn't talk about what it was about um, because it would never have got on the telly. You know, if I'd have, if I'd have said, when I said, oh, do you want to do Top of the Pops? What, what's the song about? If I'd have said Robot Prostitutes, I wouldn't have gone on it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just a, that's a truth. That's a fact, you know. So I had to be a little bit guided. Do you know that my my memory is pretty awful, actually. That's <laughs> that's, that's the truth. Um, but I I actually don't remember ever being asked back then what it was about, which, which it seems unbelievable, doesn't it? But so I probably was, but I've got no memory of it at all because I, I don't remember ever deliberately trying to keep it a secret. You know, I just don't think it came up what it was about. Was was the press more interested in you know having having quite an obtuse angle and being hysterical about this and that rather than really asking what it was you were trying to say? Perhaps I think so. Yeah, I mean they they seem to be in such a rush to just ridicule the whole thing and and me along with it, obviously, uh, and to make this connection between machine music and what I was doing. You know, you know they wanted to they wanted to to say that m the music that we were writing. If you were an electronic act. The music that you, that you were writing was all done by machines, and it wasn't real, and you didn't really sit down and do it. And, you know, so a lot of um, sort of ignorant things were, were were written back back then, right right at the very beginning. Anyway, I mean, it didn't last too long. The hostility did, but not that sort of ignorance. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, at one point the musicians' union tried to ban me because they said I was putting real musicians out of work. How insulting is that? Yeah, well, fucking you think of how many musicians you must have employed over the decades as well. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, it's just, it just, yeah. I, I sit there the same as anybody else in, with a piano, and I play my tunes. You know, so it's all written by hand. It's never written by machine ever. And then I got, you know, I had a six-piece band. I have more people, more musicians in my band than most of the other people on top of the pops. You're like three or four pieces of band. And yet they tried to, they actually did. I mean, they probably tried to ban me. I had to fight it. I, I had to fight for quite some time. They banned my drummer. He, he wasn't allowed to do something for a while. I can't remember what he did. But proper hostility, you know, real 
a real move against electronic music from the people that I was that were meant to be fighting on my behalf because I was a union member. Well, the idea of it not being emotional as electronic music is is obviously ridiculous as well. But mm -hmm. the book that yeah. I write my chapter about uh, you you in is called Albion's Secret History, and um, in it, 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 you know, the subtitle is Snapshots of England's Pop Rebels and Outsiders. And something I was really struck by, Gary, when I was reading uh, Revolution is just what a hard time you got of people, you know, in the way you've just talked about just now, just making life difficult for you. And do you think, I mean, we don't want to get, I don't want to turn this into like COD therapy or whatever, but <laughs> it, what always happens if you're being innovative, if you're trying to strike out? Is it envy because you were successful? Why is it that we're not, you know, as a country, more supportive of people being innovative in some way? I'm not sure. Um, I really, I mean, I wish I'd have a, an easy answer to that, but I've never really understood it. Um, it, it was difficult, and I, I wonder sometimes, you know, when something new comes along, you know, there will be especially something like electronic music, which, which if, was seen as a threat to the, to guitar dominance, and I didn't help that by saying things along those lines for for some of the, those early interviews. And so you got people who are very deeply in, sort of enmeshed in 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 guitar as a as a culture of modern music. The guitar was the, the pinnacle. You know, below that you had other things, right down to drummers at the bottom. Sure. <laughs> drummers would argue, but that's pretty much the way it's. You know, guitars were everything. So, you, some you come along and start saying, "Well, actually, you don't need guitars." You know, I did have them, but I, you know, you don't need guitars. You know, they don't need to be the main thing. This instrument, this synthesizer, this can do more. It, this can express more because it's not just the melody that you're playing. It's a very sound itself that you're searching to give you the feeling and the emotions that you're trying to that you're trying to present so i saw it as a much more human instrument yeah but it was it, yeah it was just it wasn't seen that way at the time by by the media at large and so i wonder if there's some sort of resentment in that some sort of fear that you're going to change music from what they want it to be into something else they don't want the fact that that it's it did really well you, you know so there might be just some um, you know that, that there's nothing worse, is there, than seeing other people raving about something that you just don't get at all. You know, I've I got a friend here that comes to visit that raves about a film called Ma Manchester by the Sea or something. Oh yeah, I've seen yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, a big successful film, but I, I didn't get it at all. I thought it was a big pile of shit. You know, um, so I'm, I'm going. Yeah, and I, I'm a, I'm a slightly more offended by it because she loves it so much. Yeah, you know I mean, so it, it's that yeah. it's that sort of thing, isn't it? So if you put yeah. that on on a much bigger scale, and you've got somebody coming along that's doing something that you just don't get at all, but it's number one and it's you know selling millions, you can sort of understand where they would feel even more determined to want to say their little thing about it and have a and try yeah. to pull it down. I think that's sort of just human nature. So, I, but I've got absolutely yeah. no. I don't have any bitterness about all that early stuff, stuff at all. You know, I fully accept that when you're, you know, at sort of a, at the cutting edge of something, all the slings and arrows that, that come because of that are, are going to come at you. Right. You know, it's the, the price you pay, I guess, for being okay. poking your head around the door first. You know, um, that's fair enough. And I genuinely accept the fact that they, they probably didn't like it. And they probably didn't like me the way I looked, what I was saying, the way I presented it, you know, it was, I don't think people were making it up. You know, they, they didn't like it. It was particularly spiteful at, at times, you know, which is unfortunate, but as a sentiment, you know, not liking the music, I, I'm, I'll be the first to say fair enough. Yeah. You, know, you don't like it. You don't like it. Well, in a way it's a compliment to you because you're doing something so unusual. That's an expression of you that it provokes this extreme reaction. But, um, what I found, I'm thinking of how you're portrayed on the on the front cover of the first album of Replicas, and you know, with the white face and the black hair, it's like a kind of an office worker, but who's to me, this was my kind of in my head, Gary, who'd been kind of drained by his life in some way, and there was something kind of uncanny about him. He kind of was, was human, but not quite. Mm -hmm. Were you kind of making a statement with that presentation of yourself, or could you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, the the. The man on the cover is a character from the stories. The, the man on the cover is, is a, a thing called a Mac Man, which is a, 
a robot or an artificial human, should we say, but with a cloned human skin. So everything, everything felt right. Everything looked right. It would even age to a degree. Um, but underneath it was artificial. And the only way you could tell them was their eye didn't have a round pupil. It had a horizontal pupil. That was the only thing that set, separated them. So on the back of the sleeve, you, you see the eye. So that's what it was. You know, a, a Mac man was one of the people that went around. Um, there was a thing called a quota test. Uh, hu human beings had to take a quota test w once a year. And if you fell below the required level of um, intelligence, then you were supposedly taken away to be re-educated for the betterment of society. You would come back more intelligent and you know, more educated than you were before, where in fact you were not. You were just taken away and you were got rid of. And just systematically, they would you know, erase people until there were so few of us left that we couldn't do anything about it anyway when it became obvious what they were doing. Yeah. The Mac men, it was the Mac men that would do the test. And so right. there was... But that's why there was a slightly sort of military militaristic look to it. Not not military, but it lent towards it. You know, it's very sort of official. Had a hint of Nazi about it. Yeah. You know, Aryan about it. Um it was a machine's idea of what you know the perfect human should be. So to what extent is it a kind of an English vision that you were having? It all seemed very English to me. Um were you particularly talking about where you think England was going to go, or is it more about where you think we're all going? Well, it was it was originally intended to be London, not right. even England, where, where I thought London was was going, we, you know, which is much yeah. the same thing, obviously, as as the rest of the country, and I suppose to a degree, much the same thing as the rest of the world. I, mean, I I I didn't envisage it as being a specifically English thing. But it was London that I was writing about from an Englishman's point of view. So you know, whether the Englishness of it is, you know, sort of is captured within that automatically. Right. Uh, I don't know. But, it, it, yeah, it was, a, it was a young Englishman's view of what yeah. London would become. Yeah. Did you ever sense that certain people who felt on the outside or a bit marginalised were going to rally to you? Did you kind of want to be... Totem totemic or even sort of iconic for people like that or, or were you just doing your thing is it, I was, is it, yeah well i wanted to be i wanted to be a rock star so there was a there was a long-term sort of plan involved as much as you can plan for something like that right um i certainly studied it studied it religiously um you know i, I knew i knew every record label what bands were on it, what sort of things they signed. Wow. I, I knew what news, what magazines and, and music papers, you know, what sort of bands they supported to where you, there would be likely to be some support or, or problems. Yeah. I, I, I tried to study it as, as much as I possibly could um, so that when I made my move, as they say, I, I would be well informed as to where my, my enemies and allies might, might lie. But events completely overtook that. I mean, I, I, I had absolutely no expectations at all that, that Arthur and Electric, for example, the first one, would get anywhere. That was my, my entire ambition for Arthur and Electric and the whole Replicas album was that I might be able to end up headlining the Marquee Club in Wardour Street. That was it, which was, what, three or 400 people, I think. I can't remember. That was it. You know, that was, that was, wow. that was lost. As lofty as my ambition was at the time, at that particular moment for that album, that was it. But then we got Agri Whistle Test, and then we got Top of the Pops in the same week. And next thing I know, I'm number one. And all of my studying was proven to be wildly incorrect, and, and I was badly informed. And, and nothing, nothing worked the way I thought it would. You know, I, I honestly thought it would take me quite a few years, several albums, and I'd chip away. And get there you know we could have, it would have been a better way to do it in some respects you know because the, the the longer the longer your journey to success the more prepared you are for it when it finally arrives you know okay. you you've had increasing exposure to a great to a larger audience to more press interest to dealing with record labels and all the different things that are involved in doing something like this you know when you're sort of dropped a very very short notice right in at the deep end of it especially when you're a solo act which it, although i was in a, a band called yeah. the army it was yeah it wasn't it wasn't really a band um you know it's an all it's pretty overwhelming 
to be honest. So, so you kind of do all of your learning with everybody watching and you inevitably make mistakes and do the wrong things and say the wrong things at the wrong moment. So it is, it's, it's, you know, it's unbelievably exciting. You know what I mean? It's not, I'm not okay. whinging about it. It's amazing. But it, it's, um, you know, there, there's a price to pay for all the good stuff that comes in and it seems to be oh, as equally shit depending <laughs> on what mood you wake up in. When there's a huge um, passionate response from fans, you know, when people are being kind of crazy or weird with you for the first time because you become really famous, I suppose it's quite hard to disentangle. Is that because what you're specifically doing is really speaking to them, really affecting them on a deep level? Or are they just being weird because you're massive, you're on TV and you're famous? I suppose it's hard to disentangle to what extent that effect is because of what you're doing as an artist or just because you're big. It's, I, think it's, I think it's all of that. I mean, I think some people relate very very deeply to what you say because yeah. it, it, it resonates with experiences in their own life um and i think there's other people that are just you, you just become this big symbol wow. um either of something they would like to be or or in, in some respects something that they particularly dislike um for some people it's inspiring you know that they wanted to go out and get their synthesizer and start doing electronic music and it was all just this amazing pandora's box of opportunity they'd never thought of before because it was all about guitars or whatever so all of a sudden you know people could sit at home in their bedrooms with a little keyboard and make music that sounded pretty much like mine and mine was number one so how great is that for people you know so there was all that going on um but but then I think there's another element of it. Well, we talked about it before, you know, we, you've become massively successful doing something that people just can't stand. You know, and they're going, who are you? <laughs> I get really nasty about it. And I think there's, there's, there's an assumption which about what it's like that, that generates jealousy in, in some people, and quite extreme jealousy in some people. Um, you know, they seem to think that you're suddenly – you know, there's millions of pounds floating around, and there's you know supermodels lining up to sleep with you, and all and all that sort of thing, which is absolutely. I thought it'd be like that, and it wasn't. I'm disappointed to hear that, Gary. Oh yeah, yeah. so so <laughs> was I. Nobody more disappointed than I when that yeah. when that when that That's... didn't materialise. But it's not like that. Well, well, it wasn't for me anyway. Not too much. It's funny, isn't it? People have a perception of what it's going to be like, and, and it doesn't sound like it marries at all with the, the actual relation to no. what the experience is. It's great. It's, it's great. And, I, and I'm sure that everyone that becomes successful will have a different story to tell. Yeah, my, my story is, is completely coloured by the fact that I'm quite reclusive and I'm, I, I've got Asperger's. So I have a whole world of issues that I needed to navigate within this new world of being famous and everybody knows who you are and the hostility and the love and, and all that is very extreme. So you find your a way to get through that and try to keep yourself sane while you're doing it and to keep your feet on the ground, to not think that you're God's gift to music all of a sudden, which would be the kiss of death. You know, you, you've got to, when I, mean, I was always very, very aware of how lucky I, I was, you know, okay. um, how many people played a part uh, an important part in getting me to where I to where I got to. I was very aware, for example, that Arthur and Electric was two songs that were stuck together. One song I couldn't finish, another song I couldn't finish. And one day I played them back to back and they went together and I thought, oh, that's handy. That got me out of a hole. You know, so so much for songwriting talent. Now, you know, not much of it there. And then one day I was playing the song back before I recorded it and I hit a wrong note because I'm not a very good player. And I thought, well, that sounds better. I'll keep that. You know, so our Fringe Electric, this great big classic song that launched my career, was, you know, two songs stuck together because I couldn't finish them and a bit of bad playing that created a mistake. Is that and the real? Sorry. That, you know, that bit. That's what, did, I was, that's what I was wondering. Is that the note you're talking about? Because that gave me yeah. goosebumps that note <laughs> it was like isn't that amazing that you're saying that's a mistake because that just yeah. felt like that yeah. and it makes the hair stand up that bit it's like it goes off grid for a sec yeah didn't write that <laughs> <laughs> what i wrote was what i wrote was was uh, a semitone lower if you ever play it play a semitone lower and right. it's pretty it's pretty it's not 
it, it doesn't sort of jar the way that note does. Um, and it's almost like a lilting ballad. Yeah, but it's a totally different animal. You put that note in it and all of a sudden it, it becomes yeah. this different, slightly aggressive thing that drives along. And so, you know, how can you come out at the end of that thinking that you've got some sort of special talent? Clearly not. You know, a bit of shit playing and not being able to finish a song. That was it. So I come through all of that, getting all this abuse, you know, for people saying that I was up myself. And I'm going, I'm the, I'm the least up myself person you'll ever meet. You know, I, I know. Well, I I don't what think happened? you come. Across, I don't think you come across that way at all. Just in the limited experience I've had emailing you and chatting with you, you, you it's a, you know you don't come across that way. And it's amazing how many people haven't spoken to people and had the impact you've had who do come across that way. So, <laughs> um, I also noticed Gary in your biography. There's there's no kind of Alan Partridge. Needless to say, I had the last laugh at all. Like like you said, you're very much you're very effusive about the support of your parents. It sounds like. They were huge in, in getting you to that point. There was yeah. no kind of rancor in the mix. It was it was strange how much weird stuff would happen to you that would be traumatic, but you were always kind of, if anything, just baffled by that, and it's a good story. Yeah, I, I, I um, it's like my wife, you know, I, I met my wife in 92, and I, and I give her absolute credit for, helping me to reinvent myself so the you know the second half of the career has been you know more more um more enjoyable than the first half i mean the first half started well but then declined fairly rapidly to a point yeah. of utter misery um and then i met Gemma, and and i it, it was it was just amazing you know the, the the patience that she showed to sit with me for a, a good year or more to just going through you know, what had gone wrong and why I was doing and listening to the, my reasons for why, why are the things that I'd done and her very calmly saying that and putting up with all my angry re replies to what she was saying and eventually until I began to understand that what I'd done and I think in my in my desire to try to salvage my career which was struggling almost to the point of oblivion by 92 um, what I'd done I'd effectively taken me out of Gary Newman album. You know, I had my singing mix really low. I had loads of backing vocals that were all over it. I replaced my guitar playing with another guitar player because he was better than me. And I just you know, took out the thing that had been such a key component of those early records because I thought I was the weak link in what I was doing. Wow. Which is, I know it seems a bit bizarre, but that is that was my thought process at the time. And she was able to to eventually make me understand that, you know, I might not be the best singer, clearly. I'm, you know, I'm never going to be the best guitar player in the world or the best keyboard player, but I, I have, a, I have a style, I have a way of, of doing things. And she said, that's what people liked. They weren't listening to your albums to listen to Virtuoso, Virtuoso guitar playing, you know, off and off yeah. the vocal. She's listening to you because you had, you played it a certain way, your melodies, are unique to the way you write music. Your voice, whether you like it or not, is distinctive and people liked it. So all you've done is taken away the very thing that they wanted and went into. So is it, not, is it any surprise then that your albums have just died? Wow. You know? and, I, and it took me, you know, because you have to be slightly, uh, there has to be a sort of slight amount of ego arrogance about you to accept that. And I didn't, you know, I, I didn't for a long time. So not having much of an ego was almost my downfall, strangely enough. And it hadn't been for her and her, it was her patience that, that made me think, you know, you know, that, that actually makes sense now that you said it. So I, I, it changed everything about the way I worked. And that change of direction, that complete change of attitude about why I was doing it and what I had to offer saved me. And then the next album, Sacrifice, and every album since then, right up to the new one, has done better than the one before. So it's been, but I mean, I, I, I credit her with that. You know, I, I credit my mum and dad with the beginning of it. There are, there are a, a number of people that have been around me, and and lucky lucky moments along the way, that that have have made it possible. In a way, I feel like I'm just a person at the back of it all that writes the songs. You know, without these other people being there, then I'm. I wouldn't be here talking to you. So I am grateful and it is genuine. She she had to um 
be very strong then because you were pushing back and it sounds like some kind of dark stuff, some anxiety, some fears were coming to the fore. And instead mm -hmm. of going, oh, this is a bit much, you know, you, he's not the Gary Newman I thought he was. She really worked through you with that to come out the other side. Like, I feel like the, the fans kind of owe her a debt of gratitude for going through that with you. But then that's a whole new stage of rebirth that you've gone through to go through that process together. Like, it sounds like it then took you to another level as a person as well as an artist. Yeah, it, it did actually, because it was more than just the music. Um, I, I'd never given much thought to the whole Asperger's thing. I talk about it very f freely now, but back then I was aware of it, but I, I, it, it just didn't mean much to me. You know, I, I, I seem to be, I, I seem to have a lot of problems with friendships, a lot of problems making them and certainly keeping them. Um, very uncomfortable around people. So I just, I just pulled away. I, I had very little to do with people in general she's sort of the opposite of that and so she comes in she has a brother that's diagnosed with asperger's she come in recognized it in me straight away and she was able to point out to me when i was being asperger's y <laughs> if there's such a word um you know we'd be at, we'd be at a, a table somewhere and i would either be you know i'll be being asperger's -y, and, and i'll feel a little kick under the table and i'd look at her and i'd say what am i doing you know, what did I, what did I say? You know, and she'd say, you know, and she'd let me know what I just said or what I just did. And so it enabled me to recognize the behavior. And so I could, I could modify my behavior in, in such a way that I, you know, if, if you know certain things that you do or certain ways you go about things or certain attitudes, you know, I'm not very good at emotional things, for example, but when you're aware you you are able to recognize a great deal of them, not everything, but you can recognize some of them. And so you can modify your behavior. So my social interaction has become smoother over the years because I'm able to think, oh, I, I shouldn't, I better not say that, that thing I was just going to say, you know, because, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, maybe, you know, now that I'm, now that my friends are turned up, I should probably stay here and talk to them. I shouldn't go out to the studio and just get on with some work because my friends are here and that would that would seem to be rude and right. i wouldn't i wouldn't have known that before my friends would turn up would hang out for me and then i just go out and wouldn't realize how rude that was because because right. you know weird stuff like like that and uh, i could give you a thousand examples of that but but so she was amazingly helpful in that area as well um and that's made me better that's made my life better um and everything everything becomes like a positive spin-off because of that, you know, creatively, personally, you know, so that, you know, right. the, these key people have made such a huge difference in my life to not acknowledge that, you know, when you're writing about your life would be an absolute fucking insult. They're a massive part of it. Was there, was there people at the time artistically, Gary, who you felt were sympathetic or, or kind of had the same mindset of you. I'm thinking a bit about, I write about John Fox in the book, and I know how he used urban places, underpasses, that kind of thing, and your work was kind of urban in that way. W were there people who you felt were on the same page as you, or did you feel alone artistically? I felt pretty much alone, actually. I was a real, I'm a huge fan of John Fox. Um, was back then when I, when I found him, um, and I've been ever since. But I did, I did a little collaboration with John Fox a year or you or two back. I love him. He's great. And he's super smart, very analytical about the music business. He sees it in a way that I've, I've never been able to, to grasp. You know, he, okay. he sees the threads that run through it and how things evolve from one into another. And it's just, it's so clever. I love talking to John. Um, so I would say that out of all of them, John Fox is probably the closest. Okay. Although I didn't recognize it too much at the time, you know, um, I just knew that I really liked what he did and I, I felt some sort of similarity. You know, things like The Quiet Man and those sort of sentiments yeah. that he was singing about a lot. I sort of thought, oh, okay, yeah. I kind of feel yeah. like that, you know. That leads me quite nicely onto a question I've really wanted to ask you. This is the question I most want to ask you is about the grey man that you saw in the tube station who comes mm. a lot up a lot in your work. Yeah. I don't yeah. know how to talk about it. It's so esoteric as an influence, but it casts such a long shadow over what you do. Why do you think that experience casts such a long shadow over you artistically, if you agree with that premise? I think because it was such a, it was such an undeniable moment that is that for, you know, the, 
the vast majority of humanity is still a mystery. Yeah. Um, right. you know, everyone's got their ghost story, and almost everybody disbelieves everybody else's ghost story. Um, and yet I had this experience, which was absolutely undeniable, with a witness, thank God. Yeah, I was thinking um, that. Uh, you, you know, so we, even me, me and him, me, me and Gary, we, 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 to this day, we still talk about it and think about it. So it, it made an impression on both of us that, that were there. Um, I, I think that's the reason why it made such an impact. You know, it, it, was, it was such a massive thing it, it, at, at the moment not a massive thing i suppose but the, you know the meaning of it the the fact of, of what you've actually just seen what you know been a part of been close to what was so in, enormous because it opens up all sorts of other questions yeah doesn't it i'm not religious i don't believe in heaven or anything like that and you're seeing that that man that ghost proves that part of what i thought was was wrong, you know. I always thought we live one life, we die. That's the end of it. Not very logical. Last it open. Yeah, but if there's a ghost, if you've seen a ghost, then that that proves without doubt that there is some form of life after death, or that there can be. My my, my own theory is that it's a, it's an accident. It's a it's an accident of nature, like a two headed snake. They're not supposed to be there, I but that. Yeah, I don't. I don't believe they're supposed to be there. I, I can't believe that nature's it's like a bleed through. I'm not even sure if it's a bleed through. Although that is possible, it's it's. It, it, I actually started. There's another book that I was going to write called it's called Pray: The Final Treachery of God, and it's about people no. that get to the moment of death, and they see heaven. And this is all based on the grey men that I saw. They see heaven. And they get just a, like a microscopic glimpse of it um, just before they, they cross over and they realise it's not what they thought at all and they do not want to go there. And so they, they twist themselves sideways and find themselves in this in-between place. Right. And there are a lot of people in it, and most of them we don't see, but occasionally we get a glimpse of one because they're, they're in between and they get a little bit closer to our world. See. And we'll just see them, not like I saw that man. He just, but he's not really there, you know. Um, it's a very flawed idea. And, and in the book, you know, God is real, um, but there is something far more powerful than God. And when these people go into this middle ground, it becomes aware of them and it's coming. And that's the big danger, this other thing that's wow. coming, which make, makes God look like a child, you know. Um, never finished it, as always. So, it, it, you know, it's had a, it's Maybe. had a, Massive effect, you know. I think two album covers I've been looking like him, Dance and I Assassin. I both dressed in, in, in you know, a, a glamorized version of what I saw, but no, it did, it, it just made a massive impact. It, it, it really did. You know, it's, how many people can say that they've been stood next to a ghost all the way up an escalator and then followed him around the corner and watched him disappear? It was interesting because when you said in the interview with John Doran that he was dressed like 40s garb, this mm. man. It's funny because I had my own little pet theory that it might have been you that you were seeing and some other kind of like checking up on you, but the forties garb kind of blows that apart a bit. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. yeah. Whoa, that's a weird one. I really like that. That's yeah. that's brilliant, actually. Yeah, man. Um, <laughs> well, the forties garb kind of like sends spent span that in another direction, but this idea that we come in and check up on ourselves or something. And, you know, then it's so kind of mind blowing that you portray that vision in your own work going forward. So you're becoming a better version of yourself as you progress artistically. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, Do you know, the problem, the problem I have now with it is that I, I, I don't, my memory of it, when I see it, it's, it doesn't have color anymore. Now, yeah. At the time it was, a, it, he was dressed in gray, but everything else was colorful, you know? Um, but now when I, when I, when I, when I remember it now, when I relive, you know that that moment. To be honest, the thing that I the, the thing that I relive is is when I first got onto the escalator and was aware that he was there. Then I rem then I remember looking back at a group of um, girls, I think, behind us. And I, I my memories of that motion turning back to look at them, and then going back. And then I just remember chatting to my friend all the way up the escalator. 
I don't remember being that particularly aware of him after that, other than that he was just a man in front, you know. But there was certainly no presence coming from him, no coldness or strangeness. And he certainly wasn't all grey. But now when I see him, the, the clothes were, but now when I see him, the skin is grey and the hand is grey. Everything is grey. So my memory is, you know, f f obviously flawed now. And, it, and it, it's a shame. I, I wish I could remember it more clearly. Yeah. I do... I do remember getting to the top of the escalator though, and him going around to the left, and, and me absent-mindedly following him, following him, uh, both of us following him. And I remember, you know, I remember the moment when we went around the corner, went a few feet, and stopped because of the wall there, and and being shocked for a minute and trying to figure out where he'd gone. Uh, I remember all of that pretty clearly. But the, the most of the actual trip up the escalator, I was just chatting to my friend, so it didn't it didn't sort of ingrain itself in there. It would all be totally different had there not been a friend there because I think the nature of memory is it's like a photocopy. We, we keep photocopying it and then like you say, it gets more and more grayscale as time goes on. You've got another person who presumably keeps photocopying it, but you were there at the same experience. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, our experience of it, it hasn't really changed. You know, our memory of it rather hasn't hasn't really changed over the years. And, you know, uh, and I, I went for a long time. I didn't didn't see this particular friend. We were probably 15, 20 years or so. We sort of lost touch. And then we bumped into each other again. And we talked about it almost straight away. And um, he, you know, his memory of it is still really clear. You know, he, he knows exactly what happened. He he, he has his, his slight version of it, of it obviously, because I think he was looking at me when we got to the top of the stairs. But... Yeah, you know, it is good. It is it is really useful that somebody else was there because you would you would doubt yourself, I think. It's a piece of the puzzle about you as an artist, if if from what you've said, and if that wasn't a component part of it, it makes me wonder what trajectory you would have gone on, you know, how you've ended up now where you are with Intruder. I mean, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, I was listening to Intruder today, Gary, and it really blew my mind, just how like the production, it just how kind of it's really gritty and meaty but at the same time it's so nuanced like i listen to it on the headphones so you can really get all of the layers and there's so many layers that are going on i just mm -hmm. wonder if like you could talk a bit about intruder and how does this fit with the whole story of you as an artist and where you are now could you talk about that a bit well with the last album i, I got I, um i think i was saying before you know it, it became very much a, a, a climate change yeah. themed type of uh, uh, in, in that climate change created the environment it wasn't actually about climate change but it created yeah. the environment that these people were now living in and it really looked at the human condition as to what people would need to become simply to survive from day to day in that environment and the terrible things that they would be forced to do and how that would haunt them some of right. them you know, and how religion could resurface in a world that had long forgotten about oh, religion. become more necessary then, yeah. Um, in the story, um, I'm not sure it came across in the album, the album as well, but in the, in the story that I was writing, they, they discover a tiny scrap of the Bible, a bit of one page of an old Bible. Um, but it has enough in there for them to start to see it as guidance. Wow. Um, and because they found it, they ultimately start to see themselves as being chosen because they were the people that found it. It must have been put there for them. That creates an arrogance. They then decide that everyone else should be living like this, the way these few lines instruct you to live. And so they then go off and start converting people, and that's brutal. And then they start to reinterpret the Bible, as seems to happen a lot. Yeah. And they reinterpret it in ways that justify increased brutality. To, to get the ends that they want. And they, sh they shape these words to create meaning to almost anything that they want to do. And I they see. consider it to be, which is how I see religion. Yeah. So I, I kind of sucked religion into this whole climate change thing. But beyond that, you know, there were, there were groups that were aware of the horrors and the brutality and were so determined not to be become a part of that they move themselves to another to the most inhospitable part of a very inhospitable world and and find a way to survive there so that they could completely separate from the rest of humanity that that that, 
that remained um, and not be corrupted by it, by the, the cruelty and the evil that, that was going on. So, I mean, it goes right back to replicas and all that sort of thing, yeah. where it's, it's this fascination that I've always had um, with how people will, what will happen to people, what will be become. Yeah, it's replicas is all about the technology. Um, Savage, the, the last album, was all about climate change and how that might affect us. But with Intruder, I've, I've taken a slightly different slant on it. I mean, Intruder is, is about, the, the title is about people, how, but the, the album itself is about the planet. If the planet could speak, what would it say? You know, how does it feel? about what's going on now you know is it disillusioned disappointed is it angry hurt betrayed you know will it fight back is it already fighting back is a virus part of it fighting back yeah. um and so the intruder that the album talks about is us you know we are we are the the virus effectively you know we are the the swarm on the planet that's causing all this trouble without us the planet flourishes and it's not completely unthinkable that nature would have some kind of a process in which it could sort out an infestation like us and it would likely be through viruses which have become ever more refined and ever more deadly you know this for this covid this is just a trial just, just see how it works you know and that's doing pretty good so that was the idea behind it but i'd already started to, you know intruder started way back when i was i was two-thirds of the way through it before the the pandemic hit so that was a weird thing because i there was already a thread of story running through it about viruses and how that would be the way and then the pandemic comes along and it was you know i thought oh that is that's weird you know this is pretty much what i wasn't specifically writing about viruses it was how the earth feels about all kinds of things but it was in there and then to see it happen was was really weird, you know, in a horrible yeah. way. Yeah, but yeah. I, I, my fascination seems to be about us and what's going to happen to us. It's not been in every album, but it's certainly been a, a regular theme that I'll, I'll go back to. Whether that's how we how we interact with religion, whether it's going to be our ultimate end. Um, even I did one called Dead Sun Rising. That was about you know when there's only embryos left and a handful of people and what, you know so I've, I've just i've always been fascinated by if there were, if there's one thing that that i sort of keep drifting back to over the years and it would be this thing about the you know what's going to happen to humans ultimately it's interesting how prescient that is as well because the whole uh, idea of how does the earth feel about this and the Earth's getting a bit of a break because we're not travelling so much. That's become more pertinent recently. So it's kind of prescient, in a way that I think a lot of artists are, that that was on your mind just before all this stuff kicked in. Uh, well, I had another thing. Back, back in um, back in 79, I, I did an album called The, the Pleasure Principle that Cars came from. And on that, I, I had... I, you know, I was aware that the majority of songwriters talk about love and you know relationships breaking down and and all of that sort of thing and i i wasn't really interested in that um so I, there was a song on there called metal which is about a, a machine that desperately wants to be human and how it's how frightened it is you know um but it's aware enough to know that it isn't so it has longing and desire and, and ultimately you know frustration but there's another song on there called me which which stood for mechanical engineering and that was a song about the, the very last machine ever. Long after the world has been destroyed and people are gone, there's just one, one machine left. And it's dusty, but it, it has like an eternal battery and it's never, it's, it's unlikely to ever die. So it's just stuck there. There's no reason for it, no, no work for it anymore. Nothing for it to do, but just sit there and think about this is it forever. And I thought that was incredibly sad. And it and it made me feel a huge amount of sympathy for machines. I remember once I was I was flying once and I had a, an instructor with me, and he said, "You share a remarkable degree of sympathy for the machinery," because I was very gentle with the throttle and all that, you know. I said, "But I, I do, I, I do," and I said, "And I talk to my aeroplane," 
And whenever I you know, whenever I land and get out of it, I I always go to the front and I pat it. I haven't got it now, actually, but when I had it, you know, I would pat it and I would say thank you for getting me back safely. I've always, I've had a relationship with machinery, which has always felt easier and less stressful and to a degree more trustworthy than relationships with people apart from my wife. Is it, is it easier to um, show affection for them? Because if something about them doesn't work, at least there's an explanation, you replace that part. Whereas when something mm -hmm. with a person doesn't work, there's a kind of a trauma or even like a karma, you could say, but we don't know what that reason was. So then it just exactly. becomes like invest in the mechanical. It's exactly that, exactly. If a machine lets you down, it didn't mean to. If a, yeah. if a human lets you down, you can never be sure that it didn't mean to. And if so there's, there's, that, the, there's that pain attached to it, emotional pain attached to a, a human relationship or, or a, a failure. Of a human I'm going to jump in and be the human that's letting everyone down and, <laughs> and creating pain. Uh, we've got to uh, end it right around here um, because uh, I, I've got another call that I have to go to. And, sure. and uh, I really right. appreciate you you giving us the time, Gary, and I'm a big fan. And oh, thank uh, you. I look forward to editing this. Okay. Um, it's good but, to speak to you. Good yeah, to it's nice to, nice to see you. And I'm going to stop.